Good morning. Welcome to The Law Show. I'm Mike McLeod, and I'll be with you for this segment of the show this morning, brought to you by the law firm Kerrigan, Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson. Our firm, for many years, has represented seriously injured people across Northwest Florida, uh, and we've hosted The Law Show for almost that many years, taking your calls and comments about our specific area of practice, which is representing seriously injured people. Um, we are also board certified trial lawyers to be board certified in Florida requires uh, trying a lot of cases, getting recommendations from other lawyers and judges and passing a very specific test just in this field of law. So you can also this morning uh, email us. I can be emailed at my email address, which is mike.mcleod at kerrigan.com. Or you can text us with your questions or comments at our main phone number, the easiest number in Florida, 850-444-4444. Text us if you have a comment or question, and we try to answer those particularly if the question we think will benefit from benefit other viewers of the show. So we know from our text that we get a lot of viewers from South Alabama who watch the law show. And so uh, this morning for this segment of the show, we're lucky to have uh, a friend and colleague, Greg Carden, with us this morning. Greg, we're going to put your picture on the screen. Greg is the lead investigator for what I think is the most preeminent personal injury law firm in Alabama, Marsh, Rickard, and Bryan. Their lawyers have a tremendous track record of success in significant cases, and Greg has played an integral part in a lot of their success. Greg, thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me, Mike. Yeah, and, and Greg's on the road. Greg, a lot of investigators who are successful spend a lot of time on the road doing a lot of different things. So I want to get into some of the things a full-time investigator for a real successful law firm does. I think it's really interesting work. So, let me, But let me introduce you first. We met for the first time. You and I were talking about it before the show aired. Um, 30 years we've known each other, and you worked for our firm, Kerrigan Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson, for five years, and I taught you everything you know about baseball, I think. That, that is true. That is true. <laughs> In fact, I think we met, I was fresh out of high school, not long out of high school. That, that's right. Uh, and we played baseball together for years when you were working for our firm, but you've enjoyed a lot of great success with Marsh, Rickard, and Brian in, in, in Birmingham and in Alabama. And so, Greg, there are some differences in the law in Alabama and Florida in these accidental injury cases. I think the main one is Alabama has what we call contributory negligence. And the basic premise is if the person who's injured, we, we'll call that the plaintiff, has any degree of fault him or herself in causing their own injuries, they don't recover in Alabama. I don't think in practice that's always true, but that's the law in, in Alabama. If the injured party contributed even a little bit to their own injuries, they can't recover anything at all in their case in Alabama. But the same case in Florida we have what we call a comparative negligence. And that means in Florida, we compare the fault of the plaintiff and the defendant and the plaintiff, the injured person can still recover for the percentage of fault that the defendant causes. And there's some other differences, Greg, and, and uh, Alabama and Florida. An example you pointed out to me earlier uh, before we got on the air is the owner of a vehicle who allows somebody else to drive their vehicle has more protection in Alabama than in Florida. In Florida, the owner is almost equally responsible as the person who drives and causes the accident. So there are some differences 
But, Greg, I think you'll agree with me that the investigation of cases, which you are a real expert in, is, is similar in both states. Yes, Mike, very much so. Um, but we do, you know, we do have to deal with the contributory negligence law um, so that if your client contributes even as much as 1% uh, to their own injury, they're barred from recovery on a, on a negligence claim. Right. Uh, it's not a defense to a, any wantonness claim you might have, um, which is a much higher bar, as you know. Yeah. But, and Greg, as far as the investigation of cases is concerned, um, it's, it's an important part of presenting a client's case and preserving a client's case. So, so as an investigator with a significant law firm, what are the things that need to be done by you and people that work with you early in a case to make sure the client's case is presented in the best possible way? Yeah, the biggest thing, Mike, is to try and get on the case immediately. The sooner the better. Um, you know, sometimes we don't get the cases until later, um, and that can sometimes put you at a disadvantage. But the sooner you get the case, the sooner you can document the evidence, preserve whatever evidence is, is needs to be preserved, talk to the witnesses while express on their mind. It's just imperative to get started early. And the longer you wait, you know, you're at a bigger disadvantage. And Greg, do but you it's just imperative to start early. Yeah. And do you agree with me that let's say we'll talk about witnesses first. It may be important to them what they saw, but it's not as important to a client. And they witnesses tend to go about their business, their recollections fade with time. They have other things to do, so you want to get get to the witnesses as early as you can. No question. And what you have to realize is these people are living lives just like you and I do. Yeah. And they want to go on about their business and what they witness, while very important to us, may not mean a whole lot to them. They may not even think what they saw is important when they're when they're a piece to a puzzle, and they just don't really want to be bothered sometimes. Yeah. And so it's not it's not a prior, priority in their life like it is ours, and so it's important that you get to that person, lock them down in whatever form, whether that's a written statement, a written affidavit, or a recorded statement. Um, you know, we do all of those types of preservation. But that way you can show the witness later on when it comes up, because as you know, these things can drag out for a year, two years, sometimes longer. Great point. And yeah, great point. recollections fade, recollections fade, and when you can put a document in front of them and say, this is what you, this is what you told me when we met two years ago. Um, you know, now that case is ready for trial or something. Are you ready to take their deposition? Yeah. They have something they can look back on and it helps refresh their recollection. Great point. So even if you get to a witness early and you document what they remember, two years later when the case goes to trial, you can refresh their memory about what they saw two years later. Correct, because like, they're just like we are. They, they forget things. And then if you put it in front of them, then they, it, it kind of comes back to them. Uh, sometimes I'll, when I meet with them, I'll, whether it's a, if it's an automobile accident or whatever type of case, if you show them some photographs, show them the statement that you took from the uh, you know, one or two years earlier, then that, that will refresh their recollection. Things come back to them. Um, so, so, Greg, what about... really helps them. Yeah, and what about, in addition to witnesses and what they see and relate to you, what about collecting and preserving physical evidence in cases? Now, I know from cases that our firm has participated in with your firm. We've had a lot of success together, uh, combining our efforts. Some of those cases involve dangerous products, dangerous tires, but what, what role does a successful investigator for a law firm play in gathering physical evidence and preserving it? Well, depending on the type of case, again, going back to, say, an automobile accident, um, you know, with that's involving just two passenger vehicles, or if you're talking about an 18-wheeler case, you you have to get to that scene. They're generally skid marks. 
damage marks. There may be marks in the on the shoulder of the road and the median of the road. Obviously, those things go away with time, and so it's imperative to get out there, document that evidence. Yeah, and, and, and Greg, what can those things tell us later? Skid marks, gouges in the road, how do those turn into helpful information? Well, they, they do will, will point you to the area of the impact, what where on the roadway this happened, what happened prior to the impact, when you start talking about pre-impact skid marks, yaw marks. Um, it can also tell you what's going on post-impact, where vehicles came to rest. And all of that becomes very important when you start talking about bringing in your expert, uh, accident reconstruction expert, um, you know, biomechanical expert, all of that stuff is important to their, to their work. So a lot of our viewers um, don't know exactly, I think, Greg, how that fits together, but you would collect, you would get to the scene as soon as possible collect, photograph a lot of this physical evidence, gou a gouge on the asphalt or pavement, skid mark, pieces of the vehicle that were not collected after the accident. But then, am I correct, you, you in many cases, get that information to an expert engineer who can piece together the physical evidence and, and help recreate how the accident happened. Correct. And almost all the time, I can get to that scene faster than I can get an expert to that scene. Right. Um, Good point. So it's important that you, you know, you get them the information that they're going to need. Um, and also, you know, we haven't talked about this yet, but preserving, the, if it's a car accident, you want to preserve the vehicles that are involved. Uh, an accident reconstruction expert is going to have to see all the vehicles involved. Um, that, you know, involves trying to secure those vehicles. Uh, generally, that, that's dealt with on an insurance carrier. If there's insurance involved, usually they're in. And you have to preserve those vehicles so that you can get your experts, generally from out of town, not all not all the time, right? but get those experts from out of town in to see those vehicles, to see the scene and any evidence you've been able to collect. So, Greg, how many junkyards do you think you've been to in your career? <laughs> <laughs> Too many to count. Right? Hundreds, I bet. <laughs> hundreds, yeah. Hundreds. And you and I were at a, a, it's not really a junkyard, it's very well run, but the two vehicles we were looking at here in Florida were perfectly what shrink-wrapped and preserved, very well protected. That, that's correct. Um, and that, that, that's how you do it a lot of times. You, you'll have nice facilities like that. Sometimes, you know, you have trouble getting to the vehicle because it may be sitting in the, you know, middle of a, of a mud puddle. Um, but we try to, we try to get those vehicles. And a lot of times, like we have a storage facility that we use in Birmingham where we store our litigation vehicles, which have inspection bays so that we can bring our experts in, yeah. in town and have them in a, in a good environment to see that vehicle so they can do all the necessary work. Hey, to hey, reconstruct an accident. Hey, Greg, there are all sorts of things we could talk about. We're running out of time. I want to get you back on the show again for another segment. Uh, for now, we're out of time. Thank you, Greg, for helping us out this morning. I'm Mike McLeod. I'm with the law firm Kerrigan Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson. We're proud to host the law show each week. Stay tuned. For over 30 years, we've been part of this great community. Kerrigan Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson, representing accident victims across Northwest Florida. For over 30 years, we've been part of this great community. Kerrigan Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson, representing accident victims across Northwest Florida. Welcome back to The Law Show, brought to you by the firm of Kerrigan, Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson.
I am Randy Thompson. I'm one of the named partners in the firm. I have been with the firm now for over 27, 28 years, I think. And I am proud to be associated with this group of folks. I say this often uh, because it means a lot to me. We don't have associates. So if you hire one of the five partners in the firm, you're going to deal with one of the five partners in the firm, not be handed off to some unknown person. Now, this morning, I want to talk to you a little bit about one of the ways that insurance companies try to limit or reduce uh, the amount of damages, the amount of compensation that an injured person is entitled to. And that way is by saying, oh, well, they had pre-existing injuries. They had pre-existing conditions. I'm 60 years old. I got a lot of aches and pains. It's part of our normal life. We're not as, for, uh, as uh, youthful anymore. And as we go through life, we have our own uh, bumps and bruises and we begin to develop stiff joints and stiff muscles. So when we get injured, when we get knocked down by a car, we, people uh, over the age of 60, any age really, we get, we get hurt and we don't bounce back as quickly as young, fit uh, people who have the same type of event. So the insurance companies love to say, oh, well, wait a minute now. Yes, he fell, but, but he already had a sore back. And so we only have to pay for what we caused. And he was going to go to the doctor anyway because he already had back pains. So just because we rear-ended him, our insured rear-ended him, and he's now going to the back doctor, he already had back pain. So don't, don't compensate him for those injuries. Here's the truth. In the state of Florida, we have what is known as the eggshell plaintiff doctrine. A lot of states have the doctrine. It's not unusual. It basically means, though, that you take the plaintiff, the injured party, as you find them. And so if a large store creates a dangerous condition on their property, whether it's improperly stacking products that fall over and hit you on the head, or whether it's mopping the floor and not putting out wet floor signs, and so you go sliding down and injure yourself, or whether it's a car accident, the at-fault party takes the plaintiff as they find him or her. So if, for example, the plaintiff already had a artificial kneecap and in the store there's a puddle that was caused by the store and the plaintiff falls and breaks that artificial kneecap, and therefore has to have a complete surgery as a result of that fall when maybe a person who didn't have an artificial knee would have gotten up and walked away. The store doesn't get a say, oh, wait a minute, though, we don't owe that because they already had a bad knee. The law in the state of Florida says you take the plaintiff as you find them. Our court systems are designed to have a pattern of jury instructions that judges and jurors are to follow so that we get a consistent result and apply the same law to all of the cases. So I want to read to you some Florida standard jury instructions that are given in jury trial cases that the jury is to consider, and it's about uh, pre-existing conditions. First of all, 
here's the here's the Florida standard jury instruction on negligence. Negligence is a legal cause of loss, injury, or damage if the negligence directly and in natural and continuous sequence produces or contributes substantially to producing such loss, injury, or damage so that it can reasonably set, be said that but for the negligence, the loss, injury, or damage would not occur. Well, that's kind of a loaded sentence, but what does it mean? If the wrongdoer acts not reasonably, acts negligently, and that action causes or substantially contributes to causing an injury, then the wrongdoer is liable for it. But here is the pre-existing injury instruction. If you find that the defendant caused a bodily injury and that the injury resulted in an aggravation of an existing disease or physical defect, or activation of a latent disease or physical defect, you should attempt to decide what portion of the injured person's condition resulted from the aggravation or activation. If you can make that determination, then you should award only those damages resulting from the aggravation or activation. However, if you cannot make that determination, or if it cannot be said that the condition would have existed apart from the injury, then you should award damages for the entire condition suffered by the plaintiff. So oftentimes we have doctors who testify well, yes, Mr. Thompson had pre-existing arthritis in his spine. But when he got into this accident, that pre-existing condition was inflamed, was activated, caused him to be more symptomatic, required that he have surgery when before he was able to get along just fine without the surgery. But now, because of his pre-existing condition and this new injury, he has to have surgery. In that example, the jury should award the injured party the entire compensation for the entire surgery and all the results that follow from that surgery. Here's another example of where insurance companies um, like to fuss and pick and try to limit the damages. Let's say you've had two or three accidents in a, a year period or a two or three year period. The first accident always wants to say, no, 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 it was caused by the second accident. And the third accident wants to say, we didn't do anything. They were already hurt by the first and the second accident. And so they like to play that game. Here's the jury instruction concerning that. You have heard that the plaintiff may have been injured in two or more events. If you decide that the plaintiff was injured by the defendant in this case and was later injured by another event, then you should try to separate the damages caused by the two events and award claimant plaintiff money only for those damages caused by the defendant. However, if you cannot separate some or all of the damages, you must award any damages that you cannot separate as if they were all caused by this defendant, right? So that makes perfect sense. If you've got an example of where a person is injured 
and then has a subsequent accident, whether it's they trip in their own house because their leg isn't working or their knee gives out or their back spasms up because of the first accident. If you cannot separate out the two events, if you can say, well, the second fall wouldn't have happened had the first injury not have occurred, then the judge instructs the jury to award all of the damages to the injured person. One more item involving these Florida standard jury instructions that fit in to the same pattern. Let's say you're in a car accident and you get rear-ended and you have to have a back surgery. And so you go in and you have a back surgery, but let's say that the doctor or the hospital staff commits medical malpractice. They operate on the wrong part of your body or they try a, a new procedure that fails or some of the products that they put in you, the cages, the screws, fail. The jury instruction in Florida is that the original actor, the original at-fault party that rear-ended you is responsible for all of the subsequent bad events that happen because of the medical care. Here's the instruction. If you find that the defendants caused loss, injury, or damage to the plaintiff, the defendant is also responsible for any additional loss, injury, or damage caused by medical care or treatment reasonably obtained by the plaintiff. That concept is basically summed up by saying, well, the original defendant started the ball rolling. I would never have had to go to the doctor had the original defendant not caused this accident. But because I did have to go to the doctor, and if there was a bad result or malpractice in that procedure, the original defendant is on the hook for that as well. Now, a separate claim can be filed by the injured person against the doctor, but they can also look only to the original actor that caused the damage. So that's some of the law involving pre-existing conditions, involving multiple accidents, and involving subsequent medical malpractice that may occur because of an accident. I would encourage you to look at our website, kerrigan.com. You'll find a lot of information about the attorneys and the types of cases that we handle. And we will be back in a few minutes to talk more about other items and other subjects. But for right now, remember, just because you have a pre-existing injury does not mean you're not entitled to make a claim under Florida law. And it does not mean that you don't have a valid uh, complaint about the pain you are suffering. We'll be right back after this commercial break. Bob Kerrigan for Kerrigan Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson. What is medical malpractice? In many ways, it's similar to an auto accident. If a driver of a car is careless and causes an accident and injures someone, the driver is responsible for those injuries. If a doctor or employees of a hospital violate the rules of medicine, they're responsible for the injuries they cause. These rules of medicine make up the standard of care that doctors and hospitals are required to follow. Medical malpractice cases are expensive to bring and can be very difficult. We're required to retain qualified medical experts to assist the jury in understanding why what was done violated this standard of care. At Kerrigan Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson, we accept meritorious medical malpractice cases where substantial injuries or a death have been caused by a doctor or a hospital failing to abide by the rules of medicine. Please see our reviews on our website at kerrigan.com. Welcome back to The Law Show, brought to you by the firm of Kerrigan, Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson. I'm Randy Thompson. You know, doing personal injury work 
we see a lot of different types of cases. We see cases that involve boat accidents. We see car accidents, obviously. We see trip and falls and slip and falls. We see product liability claims, medical malpractice claims. One of the claims that we see, one of the categories of claims that we see are bicycle accidents, bicycles getting injured when they interact with cars. So number one, did you know that Florida has a March bicycle month? So March in Florida is bicycle month. And there are a number of rules and a number of regulations that apply to bicyclists, not motorcyclists, bicyclists. Um, and these cyclists oftentimes get injured when they interact with vehicles. So I want to talk a little bit to you this morning about the bicycle laws that apply in the state of Florida. For those of you who are uh, statute nuts and who like to read the Florida statutes, you can find most of the rules involving bicycles at Florida Statutes 316.2065. Florida Statute 316.2065. I want to talk to you about some of those highlights, some of the main points of, of that statute and the laws, and then how they interact with what cars do and what cars are required to do. First of all, first and foremost, bicyclists have all of the rights and all of the duties applicable to the driver of any other vehicle on the road. Well, what does that mean? That means that if you're on a bicycle and you're on the road, you are supposed to ride with the flow of traffic. You are supposed to obey all traffic signals, stop signs, stop lights, green lights, and you are to exercise all of the requirements that a motorist would exercise. Keep a lookout for objects. Be aware of your surroundings. Don't operate your bicycle negligently. A bicycle rider may not ride more than the bike is designed for. In other words, if your bike only has one seat on it, you're not supposed to put another person on the bicycle. You can't ride on the handlebars like we did as kids. If you have a child who is under the age of four or under the age, uh, weight pound of 40 pounds, then they can ride in a bicycle seat uh, securely attached to the bicycle that keeps their legs and hands out of the moving parts of the bicycle. A bicycle rider must carry, here's the statute, a bicycle rider must carry any passenger who is a child under four years of age or who weighs 40 pounds or less in a seat or carrier that is designed to carry a child of that age and size. Another law, a bicycle rider or passenger who is under 16 years of age must wear a bicycle helmet that is properly fitted and fastened. And the passenger, which includes a child in that child seat, must also wear a helmet and that includes, even if these children, if you've seen these little trailers that bicyclists pull behind them, and it's a trailer that sometimes has a little tent on it and a seat for the passenger, that passenger, infant passenger, has to have on a helmet as well. Any person operating a bicycle on a roadway shall ride in the lane marked for bicycle use, or if no lane is marked for bicycle use, 
as close as practical to the right hand curb or edge of the roadway. All right, that's the general rule. You mean to tell me that if I'm on a bicycle, I am supposed to be riding on the road and not on the sidewalk? Absolutely. When you ride your bicycle on a sidewalk, you are considered to be a pedestrian and you must follow the rules of the sidewalk, including yielding to anybody walking on the sidewalk. So if I'm on a bike and I'm on a sidewalk and you're walking toward me, I'm supposed to yield to you, even if that means moving off of the sidewalk so that you can safely pass as a pedestrian. Bicycle experts say cyclists, bicyclists, are much safer if they ride on the road. And remember now, you've got to comply with all the rules of the road. So if you're on a bicycle, you are to ride in the same direction of traffic that you're riding with. We in our practice see a lot of times when cyclists are pedaling the opposite way of the flow of traffic. And I think a lot of people do that because they want to see the cars coming toward them so they can see if the car is paying attention and, and if they uh, you know, are in danger. But the law in Florida requires the opposite of that. You are to ride with the flow of traffic. Here's one, here's one great reason for that. Let's assume you're in a vehicle and you pull up to an intersection where you're either going to turn left or right. You know, you're pulling out of your neighborhood and you come to the main road and you're either going to go left or right. And let's assume that you're in your car and you're going to turn right. What do we do as motorists? We look to our left and see if there's any cars coming from our left. And when they're not coming from our left, we start to pull out and go right. But if the bicyclist is coming the wrong way on that side of the road, we never see him. And that puts the cyclist in a lot more danger of getting hurt and getting injured. So that's the reason that a lot of people don't understand of why you ought to be riding in the road and riding with the flow of traffic. Here's another law. Every bicycle in use between sunset and sunrise shall be equipped with a lamp on the front exhibiting a white light visible from a distance of at least 500 feet to the front and a lamp and reflector on the rear, each exhibiting a red light visible from a distance of 600 feet to the rear. So those are some of the laws that apply to uh, bicycle use in Florida. What are the laws that apply to motor vehicles when they encounter bicyclists. This is something that a lot of motorists don't either understand or don't appreciate or don't follow. If you're in a car and you are attempting to pass a bicycle that is riding on the road, you are required to give that cyclist at least three feet width when you're passing. Uh, I spent a lot of time on bicycles. I spent a lot of time riding up and down the roads here in Pensacola and around Northwest Florida. You would be amazed at how many people violate that rule. So if I'm riding down the road and if a motorist is coming up behind me and if that motorist doesn't give me that three feet space, and just scares me and drives on past, well, do I have a claim against that motorist? No, because I wasn't physically injured. I wasn't harmed. But if that motorist, because of their mirror, hits me or knocks me off and knocks me down to the ground, do I have a claim against that motorist? Absolutely, I do. Well, how are you going to find him? A lot of bikes these days have GoPros, 
or cameras that record and we can identify the license tag and capture the owner of the car and capture who the insurance carrier is for it through the Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles and and we can be found. The other day I was riding down the road and a large school bus came by and certainly did not give me three feet of space. I got off my bike, I called the uh, school board, I talked to the bus director operations, I told them where the bus was and, and what time it was. And all of that information goes to alerting the driver of that bus to, hey, people are watching you, people are paying attention, be aware of your surroundings. The other thing I would say about uh, motorist interacting with bicyclists is I probably have thousands of cars pass me on the roadside and I never have any issue at all. But every now and then, somebody, they're having a bad day or they're just aggravated, uh, honks for the purpose of trying to scare you yells at you, screams at you, uh, cuts you off on purpose. The best thing you can do if you're a cyclist is to not escalate the situation. The best thing you can do is to just be aware that not everybody's like that. Don't escalate it. Don't get in a road rage, a road rage incident with the vehicle because you're on a bike exposed and you're going to lose that rage and it's not going to do anything to help you. So as a cyclist, we try to be uh, very aware of our surroundings and we try to alert the motorist that we're there, that we're going to turn left, that we're going to turn right that uh, we are stopping for a stoplight or a stop sign. So have a little common courtesy, be aware of your surroundings, uh, be generous and courteous to bicyclists uh, who are trying to enjoy the day and uh, getting some exercise. And hopefully nobody gets hurt and nobody gets injured. Unfortunately, though, as a plaintiff's lawyer, we see a lot of injuries and we have to deal with those injuries and help the people who have been injured by them. Our firm is Kerrigan Estes, Rankin, McLeod and Thompson. I would encourage you to go on to our website, kerrigan.com, and look at our information that's there. We have a lot of helpful information about the laws in Florida, about the attorneys who are with this law firm the areas of law that we practice in. And of course, you can always call us or email us and we'll be glad to try to answer your questions and help you, hopefully, if you know, you've been injured through the fault of someone else. Kerrigan Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson, those are the five attorneys in this firm. Those are the people who will help you if you call and ask for our help. And we'll be glad to sit down and talk to you about any potential claim you have. We thank you for watching. We'll be right back after this brief commercial break. I'm Bob Kerrigan. Have you seen the young lawyer advertising standing on top of a truck? I wonder who he would hire if he fell off the truck. Maybe the lawyer who has hundreds of billboards up and down the interstate. If it happened in Florida, though, it couldn't be him because he doesn't even have a Florida law license. He wouldn't hire the lawyer who barely has time to eat with his family because he just seems too busy. Maybe the lawyer who busts down his office wall. That may not be a good place to be if another wall is crashed through. If he called us, we'd tell him it wasn't the brightest idea to climb up on top of the truck in the first place. With the highest ethical and legal ability rating from Martindale Hubble. We represent one client at a time, and we've represented thousands of clients over the years. Your case will be handled by a board-certified partner, board-certified in civil trial by the Florida Bar. Kerrigan Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson at Kerrigan.com. Welcome back. I'm Mike McLeod. I'll be with you for this segment of The Law Show, brought to you by the law firm Kerrigan, Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson. Our firm 
specializes in cases that involve accidental injury, wrongful death cases. We have limited our law practice solely to helping people who've been seriously injured in accidents, and we've done it for 40 years across Northwest Florida. We have offices across the Panhandle, and we have, again, limited what we do. Our specialty is focused solely on helping people who've been seriously injured in accidents. Our lawyers are board certified in civil trial law. That is the type of specialty uh, associated with personal injury cases. And uh, to be board certified, a lawyer has to have tried a number of cases, a lot of cases, gotten recommendations from the lawyers on the other side of cases, and the judges that they try cases in front of in order to qualify to take a very specialized test. This is over and above the bar exam uh, because it is an opportunity for lawyers to show uh, objectively an area of specialty. The Florida Bar allows this and our lawyers are board certified in personal injury type cases. <coughs> We're proud to host the law show each week. During this segment of the show, we like to address the questions or comments of our viewers. It's easy to comment or send a question to us on the law show. Our main phone number is maybe the easiest number around. It's all fours, 850-444-4444. You can also text us at that number. You can text me if you have a question that you'd like us to address on the law show. We'll do it, especially if the question will benefit our other viewers. Also, my email address is mike.mcleod, it's M-C-L-E-O-D, mike.mcleod at kerrigan.com. If you have a question or comment about the show, you can text us at our all fours number, or you can email me <coughs> at that email address. So we have a couple of questions uh, that we're going to answer today on this segment of the show. Uh, the first is, can you talk more about purchasing car insurance in Florida and things that are important to know about in order to make a better choice? So that's what we'll do for a while. Um, so we, we don't sell insurance, of course, but we are lawyers and part of every case is looking for a source of funds to help our clients who've been injured in accidents. And so we deal with matters of automobile insurance, um, car insurance, in ev almost uh, uh, every automobile insurance injury case. And so um, a lot of people like to say, well, I've got full coverage and they feel very good about it. Hey, I've got full coverage on my car insurance. But when we buy automobile insurance, it's kind of like a buffet. There are a lot of different choices to be made and so car insurance can be pretty expensive in today's world. And so I think it's helpful and important to know what you're getting for this money. So there are a lot of different things to pick from. One thing in Florida that is mandatory and required in every automobile insurance policy is personal injury protection coverage. So the Florida automobile insurance system is that every insurance policy in Florida for residents, for um, non-commercial, non-taxi type things, requires personal injury protection coverage. And it provides for $10,000 of medical expenses or lost wages for every uh, person who has an insurance, automobile insurance policy in Florida. And that $10,000 pays 80% of one's medical bills or 60% of one's lost wages, no matter who's at fault in the accident. So even if you're at fault in the accident, um, your PIP coverage will pay $10,000 of your medical bills and, and lost wages, 60% of your lost wages, 80% of your medical bills. Um, that's mandatory. Also, we're required to carry at least $10,000 of property damage liability coverage in Florida. So property damage liability coverage is just what it sounds. 
you buy coverage in case you cause an accident and you damage somebody else's property, you're required to carry property damage liability coverage. And those are the only two types of coverages that we're required to carry in Florida, which is abysmal that Florida doesn't have better legislation requiring more coverage. And look, just look at the cars today. Ten, you know, most cars cost now well over, many, many times over $10,000. So people that have minimal coverage in Florida, I think are woefully uninsured for accidents property damage that they might cause. It's not unusual to see a $100,000 car driving down the, the highway in Northwest Florida. Cars are a lot more expensive now. So um, those are the two mandatory things that we're required to carry in Florida. Now there are a lot of options. Bodily injury liability coverage is coverage that we buy in the event that we cause an accident that injures another person. And so the choices to make there are, do I want that coverage? We think it's very important to um, have that coverage in the event that we cause an accident and injure somebody else. Because even though I think we have a moral obligation to carry that kind of coverage, you want to buy enough bodily injury liability coverage to protect your assets in the event that you cause an accident and an injury. And so I think in order to evaluate that, you should discuss and spend time with the agent who's selling you insurance. Unfortunately, a lot of times you just people just buy it over the internet, but do you own your home? Do you own investments? Do you own, do you have a savings account? Do you wanna protect your assets up to a certain level? And the more perhaps financially, uh, financial assets one has, the more coverage that one can buy. It's not uncommon to see policies in Northwest Florida with little or no bodily injury liability coverage. It's um, also not unusual to see coverage where somebody has $100,000 of liability, bodily injury liability coverage, and sometimes an umbrella policy that provides additional coverage. So we think that everyone should have bodily injury liability coverage evaluate how much, consider raising your liability limits. Um, and then um, another optional type of coverage is uninsured motorist coverage. And so um, we've looked at these statistics on the law show before, a, a, a pretty big percentage of drivers in Florida have little or no bodily injury liability coverage. And so there's a 30% chance if you get hurt in an accident that's not your fault in Florida, the other guy is going to have poor insurance to pay for your injury and losses because of an injury. And so if you buy uninsured motorist coverage, that's coverage you buy that stands in the shoes of the other driver who is at fault. It ensures that you will be compensated for a serious injury in the event that the guy who rear ends you runs a red light, so on his he has or her text or cell phone texting, who has poor insurance, and that you're not going to be left out in the cold without any compensation because you've bought uninsured motorist coverage to protect you. We think in Northwest Florida, South Alabama, where our show is viewed is very important to consider buying uninsured motorist coverage. It protects you. And so the same process applies to how much coverage when we were talking about bodily injury liability coverage. You can buy different amounts of uninsured motorist coverage. And the higher your limits, the more protection you have. You can buy, uh, you can buy up to the amount of bodily injury liability coverage you purchase on your policy. So if you buy $100,000 of liability insurance to protect others, you can buy $100,000 of uninsured motorist coverage to protect you, people that are riding with you, and members of your family who live with you. The other somewhat unique thing about uninsured motorist coverage is that you can add together or stack the coverages on 
each of your vehicles. So if you have two, three, or more vehicles and you buy uninsured motorist coverage, you have the option of adding those vehicles together to increase the amount of your uninsured motorist coverage. So if you buy stacked un uninsured motorist coverage for $100,000 and you have three vehicles, then that coverage becomes $300,000 of coverage. And um, you pay a little bit extra premium for that, but it's a pretty reasonable in today's insurance market, it's a pretty reasonable thing to do. And you're buying the coverage that that protects you, it, that will pay you in the event of a serious injury or an injury when the other person is not adequately insured. So that's something we think you really should um, look at when you're buying uninsured motorist com coverage. And all of these things are um, things that you really ought to discuss with, I think, your insurance agent who will should should spend a little bit of time with you find out about your assets your home is protected by the homestead e exemption in in florida um, but if you have other assets i think it's important to share some of that information with the person who's selling you car insurance to find out well how much should your limits be um, in order to fully um, protect yourself when you buy insurance so this, this common phrase, well, I've got full coverage, there are just so many choices that we make when we buy insurance, it just really has almost no, no meaning whatsoever. I really think a lot of people who, who talk about full coverage just mean, well, I've got enough to get my car licensed and be on the road, which is almost no coverage. Um, so I think the bottom line is I think it's helpful to have an agent, not just buy insurance over the internet and ask, have, have a conversation with somebody about what is adequate to protect you with the goal of what, what you, with the goals that you wanna meet there. A Couple of other small things, you can of course buy collision coverage on a vehicle in case you back into a tree, back into a mailbox, which I just did. Um, uh, you, your insurance company will pay to have your car repaired if it's totaled, will, will replace the car at the fair market value of what it was. Collision coverage is required if you've financed your vehicle. Whoever's financing your car, the bank is going to require you to have collision coverage in case you damage it and it's your fault. Um, uh, comprehensive coverage is something that will pay in case things are stolen, vandalized in your automobile. So these are all things that we pick and choose. I think the bottom line is it's important to think about it ahead of time, talk to a, somebody ahead of time, evaluate your needs, your the assets that you want to protect. Okay, so I think we're really out of time with that one question today. I'm Mike McLeod. I'm here today for all the lawyers with Kerrigan, Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson. We specialize in these cases where people are seriously hurt in accidents. We've done it for a long time, and we're proud to host The Law Show every week. Thanks for watching. See you next week.